It's been over a decade since AWS and Intel began our journey together. We have combined the depth and breadth of AWS cloud services with the performance and dependability of Intel custom processors so our customers can build tools for the fast-growing future. Together, we're making technology more accessible by optimizing our global infrastructure. And we're reinventing the capabilities of data and analytics with powerful AI through an engineering collaboration that pushes the boundaries of innovation. But it wasn't these ideas that changed the world. It's how AWS customers use these innovations to bring their own ideas to life. It's how Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center can analyze data from more than 15,000 biological samples. A process that previously took seven years of compute time now takes just seven days. It's how the Australasian Wildlife Genomics Group at the University of Sydney can support conservation efforts of native wildlife by reducing genomic analysis time from 10 days to five hours. It's how Europe's delivery hero shortened their monthly billing runs, a 20-hour task down to 90 minutes. And we're excited because this is only the beginning. Today, AWS and Intel are working together to put our most advanced technologies into your hands so you can think bigger, build better, and innovate faster. Whether it's tomorrow or 10 years down the road, we can't wait to see what you do next. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Worldwide Public Sector Summit. I am so excited that you're joining us today. I want to start by thanking our sponsors who have made this event possible and possible every year, especially our global sponsors, Intel, VMware, Datadog, Dynatrace, and Splunk. All of the sponsors you see here offer services and expertise that can accelerate your cloud journey and help you realize your mission outcomes. So I encourage you to explore all our breakout sessions with all these partners and visit them in the learning zone to learn more about all of their services and applications as you see them listed here. Thank you, part. Thank you again, partners. The Worldwide Public Sector Summit is an opportunity to learn, explore, and be inspired. I want to emphasize that final point, inspiration. I continue to be inspired by the incredible innovation happening around the world. Here are just a few examples. In the Middle East, space agencies are maturing rapidly. Just two months ago, the United Arab Emirates Hope Orbiter reached Mars. In Asia, governments have developed digital track and trace applications that are helping to control the spread of COVID-19. In Latin America, new healthcare tools have ushered in an age of virtual care. And in the United States, government agencies are using Amazon Connect to rapidly deploy digital contact centers to interact with citizens and to get them the information and services they need in real time. This digital process reduces wait time from hours to literally minutes. I'm also inspired by all of you who have responded to adversity by thinking big, doing big, and building a better future. To healthcare workers, thank you for serving on the front lines against COVID-19. To educators, Thank you for finding new ways to teach when the world was turned upside down. To not-for-profit leaders, thank you for showing us the best about all of our communities. And to those of you in government, including all the men and women around the world in our defense and national security agencies, thank you for serving our nation's best interests every minute of every day. We know that you're asked to achieve mission outcomes that are far greater than resources you have available and at hand. And we're inspired by the innovative ways that you use AWS's cloud to deliver those results. But we're not gonna rest until you have all the tools you need to get the mission done. So thank you, thank you for inspiring me, for inspiring all of us here at AWS. And if we've learned anything in the last year, it's that change is constant and that the most successful organizations embrace that change and the possibilities that it provides. 
In that spirit, I'm so excited to announce that Max Peterson is taking the helm as Vice President of Worldwide Public Sector. Max, come on, join me on stage. Hey, 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 hey. How are you? hey. It's good to see you. Max, he's been at AWS for nine years, first leading our partner and capture business, and then going overseas to lead our international business. I could not be prouder of what we built around the world, Max, with our customers. Since I founded the AWS Worldwide Public Sector business 11 years ago, we've accomplished a lot, but we still have a lot to do. So a decade back, a decade ahead, we started the business with a firm belief that public sector should have access to the same innovative technologies as any of the world's most exciting startups and the most successful enterprises. And we have made that a reality around the world. And we're, we're always here, and we have an unwavering commitment to you, our customers and our partners. And we're gonna remain committed to paving the way for disruptive innovation and making the world a better place. And without any further delay, I'm gonna hand it over to Max so he can get started. Max, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. I am so incredibly humbled and so incredibly excited by what we have ahead of us, continuing to drive innovation in the public sector and striving to make the world a better place. In fact, one of the most expiring examples is the heroic work of healthcare professionals and medical researchers to combat COVID-19. To support their work, we launched the AWS Diagnostic Development Initiative last year. We focused on diagnostics because an accurate detection is critical to effective response. And diagnostics require a lot of research and computing power. So last March, we committed $20 million in credits and technical expertise. And since then, AWS has supported more than 80 customer-led initiatives across 17 countries. Some of you may know I love gadgets. I'm a geek at heart, which is one of the reasons why I'm so inspired by the work being done by the Stanford University School of Medicine. With the help of DDI, Stanford researchers have developed a smartwatch app that alerts users when their bodies show signs of fighting a COVID-19 infection. The app is powered by an algorithm that detects changes in an individual's resting heart rate and step count. So please help me welcome Dr. Michael Snyder of the Stanford University School of Medicine to explain more. At the beginning of the pandemic, as COVID-19 cases continued to rise, we quickly realized the need for improved pre-symptomatic infection tracking through more accessible and inexpensive methods to help curb transmissions, keep people healthy, and ease the burden of our healthcare systems. Because smartwatches and other wearable devices are used by nearly 60% of the global population, and they measure many physiological parameters such as heart rate, sleep, and temperature, our research team saw the opportunity to leverage these technologies to track cases in real time. So we developed a smartwatch app to alert users when their bodies show signs of fighting an infection, up to 10 days before they're even aware of any symptoms. Ultimately, our goal is to let individuals know when to quarantine or prompt them to get screened. We had uncovered the ability to detect Lyme disease and other respiratory illnesses through wearable devices back in 2017. And we've been able to increase the scale of this research with the cloud during the pandemic. In the first phase of our study, we analyzed user data and developed an algorithm that could reliably detect abnormal patterns and flag signs of COVID-19 or other flu-like illnesses. We were able to grow the study through additional tech support from the AWS Diagnostic Development Initiative. We're now entering phase two to further refine this algorithm and increase its accuracy above 70%. And we are seeking participants to join our study to help us reach our goal of 10 million users. Through these efforts, we are continuing to generate more and more wearable device data. We have built our data processing pipelines and we'll soon be building a data lake to combine this wearable data with our genomics data for researchers all around the world to access thus providing a collaborative platform to support the advancement of precision medicine as the first of its kind. We're hopeful that ongoing screening using wearable devices can provide scalable diagnostic solutions to overcome the current testing barriers and that expanding data access to a broader range of researchers will contribute to new discoveries that will improve human health. 
We look forward to continuing to push the boundaries of what is possible with the cloud. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Snyder. Seeing the meaningful results emerge from the DDI funded projects is inspiring all of us to think bigger. And so this week, we're announcing a second round of DDI funding. And this time we're going to expand eligibility to include other early disease detection systems. So researchers who are focused on COVID-19 and other infectious diseases can apply for funding today. Visit the URL you see on the screen to get started. I'm particularly excited about our new round of DDI funding because it's designed to deliver real mission outcomes. And that's the goal of everything that we do at AWS. We spent 15 years being the cloud provider who supports your mission critical goals. We know that technology needs to be secure. It needs to give you the flexibility and the speed to respond to an unpredictable world. And that's why over the last 15 years, AWS has moved faster than any other cloud provider to create the tools and the services that allow you to do just that. And the truth is cloud computing has changed a lot since AWS first launched S3, our storage service 15 years ago. We now provide customers with hundreds of services and solutions that are designed to solve real customer challenges. For example, one of the fastest growing services in the public sector is Amazon Connect. Governments around the world are using Connect to respond faster to their citizens and to deliver a citizen experience that sets the bar with the best private sector companies. In a recent pilot program, one government customer used Amazon Connect to reduce call wait times from three hours to three minutes. That's the type of service I know that I want. Services like Amazon Connect have changed the way public sector customers use cloud computing. And you can see the difference from the very beginning of a customer's journey on AWS. As recently as four years ago, most cloud conversations started with teams in their central IT department. Customers would identify an existing workload. They develop a plan to migrate the entire application to AWS. And that was the extent of the work. Today, the momentum has shifted. Mission owners are now the ones identifying urgent business and mission needs, and then working with their IT teams to develop complete solutions that are born in the cloud. Let's take a look at a recent example. Last spring, we worked with the state of Rhode Island to rapidly scale the state's unemployment insurance system. Almost 250,000 people used the new system, and this gave the state the large volume of data about workforce needs. Mission owners realized that that data could also be used to connect individuals to new jobs. And so the state teamed up with a nonprofit, Research Improving People's Lives, and built a secure data lake on AWS. Then they applied an AI algorithm called HOPE to the data. The algorithm provides users with job recommendations that match their skills and experience. And the system gives mission owners real time information about the effectiveness of workforce development programs. With these insights, they can guide future decisions and ensure that funding supports the most effective programs. Now, isn't that an incredible, powerful idea? An important lesson from the state of Rhode Island is that continuous innovation is possible if you build your cloud strategy from day one. And that's the reason why we're so excited to see the growth of public sector startups building on AWS especially in emerging fields like space. Just a few weeks ago, we launched a program to help public sector startups called AWS Space Accelerator. We created this program in collaboration with Seraphin Capital. The program is designed to help businesses and startups become mission ready and profitable fast by building their space missions on the cloud. There is still time to apply, so please, Visit the URL on screen for more details.
The AWS Space Accelerator is an example of an important point. You can build faster as part of a community. AWS and our partners are dedicated to helping you move fast. And so you aren't delayed or constrained by limited resources, you should think about our partners as force multipliers. They have the experience supporting virtually every public sector mission. In fact, the AWS Partner Network has tens of thousands of APN partners. And what's important for customers around the world, 60% of them are located outside of the United States. Let's take a look at one example of how AWS partners allowed our customers to scale their impact. Now, last January, the John Hopkins University built one of the world's first COVID-19 dashboards. For weeks, the team at John Hopkins manually updated this dashboard. But as the traffic to the dashboard continued to grow, Esri, an AWS partner, reached out to Johns Hopkins. And they offered to help scale up site capacity and to automate the intake of COVID-19 data. And Esri's help couldn't have come at a better time because soon the dashboard became one of the most important sources of COVID-19 data in the world. This project shows the importance of fostering and enabling young talent and the role that AWS and our partners can play to help take an idea and scale it up to billions of users around the world. Of course, no discussion of the mission would be complete without discussing the critical mission of distributing COVID-19 vaccines. And we're proud to be supporting customers around the world. Here's a few examples. In India, the national government is using AWS to support an on online vaccine registration system and scheduling system. More than 1.9 million people access the system on the first day. And more than 1 billion people are expected to use the system eventually. In the US, AWS has also offered our support to the Biden administration. And we've supported states and academic medical research centers with vaccine distribution. This includes both the state of Minnesota and the state of South Carolina, where leaders used Amazon Connect to operate appointment hotlines. Now, we've talked about the importance of mission, but you can't achieve mission without world-class security. I'm sure you've heard Teresa say that AWS is better, faster, and less expensive with security by design, but this is just a starting point. It's not the finish line. Security is our top priority, and AWS provides customers with distinct security capabilities. These capabilities can't be achieved on premise or through other cloud providers. So let's dive deeper into a couple of specific benefits. First, Amazon EC2 instances are built upon the secure foundation of the AWS Nitro system. Nitro continuously monitors, protects, and verifies the computing instance hardware and firmware. Nitro also minimizes any attack surface by offloading virtualization resources to dedicated hardware and software. And finally, Nitro's security model is locked down. It prohibits administrative access. It eliminates the possibility of human error and tampering. And with the launch of Nitro Enclaves, you can now create complete isolated compute environments. This allows you to further protect and securely process highly sensitive data. AWS also stands out because we use artificial intelligence to provide security. And that is supported by concrete evidence. We call this approach provable security. And it's powered by automated reasoning technology. Automated reasoning applies mathematical logic to help answer critical questions about your infrastructure and detect entire classes of misconfigurations. It could take a large organization months or years to manually prove that every data path and the associated controls are correct and secure. Even then, your systems are constantly changing. With automated reasoning, this work can be done in seconds. At AWS, we use automated reasoning to evaluate services. 
like Amazon S3. Finally, we've put 15 years of security experience to work for you. If you look at recent cyber attacks, they've largely impacted on-premise systems. And if you manage your own infrastructure, you're responsible for staying one step ahead of these emerging threats. With AWS, you've got an experienced ally. Among other benefits, we pursue security certifications so that you can use these to support your own security certification programs. In fact, AWS recently became one of the first cloud service providers to achieve ISMAP certification from the government of Japan. You can also benefit from our years of experience protecting some of the world's most sensitive workloads. That includes more than three years of experience securing data across the full range of government data classifications, including top secret. And last but not least, we work with customers to share security knowledge and best practices. In March, we signed a strategic alliance with the Organization of American States. And under this agreement, AWS will provide governments across Latin America with a cybersecurity assessment, an implementation guide, and a clear way to improve their cybersecurity posture. Let's look at one more security service to show how we share our knowledge and our experience with you. I hope you've heard of AWS Guard Duty. This continuous threat detection service uses machine learning, anomaly detection, and integrated threat intelligence to continuously monitor, identify, and prioritize threats. And what makes this service so special is that it's always learning and always evolving. As soon as we understand a pattern of attack, we bake that into the service and we send notifications out to customers. For example, we continuously add new detections for software supply chain and ransomware threats. These detections alert customers to the potential need for action. So I encourage all of you today, enable AWS Guard Duty. Now I don't only want to share information with you, I really like to share real steps that you can take today to improve your security. So here are five simple steps. They don't take a lot of time or money. And the first one is to make sure your account information and your security contacts are up to date. The second one, limit your attack surface. Use AWS tools and roles and security groups to control access. As I said a minute ago, number three, enable guard duty to take action on guard duty findings. Fourth, talk to your AWS security competency partners. They'll help you augment or extend your capabilities. And finally, please leverage the AWS well-architected tool and our support resources. This tool provides you with security guidance, including how to protect your systems and how to detect security events. Now, I wanted to do this deep dive on security today because it is literally top of mind for every public sector customer. And customers who are leveraging AWS and our partners are seeing real results. For example, uh, Tim Romer, the CISO from the state of Arizona, worked with the AWS partner CrowdStrike to gain immediate visibility across the state's IT infrastructure. Previously, Tim and his team needed to manually monitor logs with CloudStrike they now use machine learning and artificial intelligence to correlate billions of events in real time. And these new tools have already helped to detect unusual activity on the state's VPN and monitor vulnerabilities related to recent supply chain attacks. Now the incidents have been low, but having real time visibility has alerted the state to potential malicious activity. And this real time view gives Tim and his team more confidence in their cyber posture. As a senior leader in the healthcare industry, our next speaker considers security and privacy her top priorities. NHS Digital CEO, Sarah Wilkinson, is responsible for maintaining a data set that represents tens of millions of individuals across the UK. This unique data set presents an opportunity to get real actionable insights that can help save lives. And it comes with the solemn responsibility to ensure that the information remains confidential, secure, and private. Here to explain how the NHS Digital achieves these goals, 
Please welcome Sarah Wilkinson. NHS Digital is the national organisation within the health and care system in the UK that is responsible for the design, build and operation of national digital products and national data systems and services. Some of the products that we deliver are intended for use by the public, uh, products such as the NHS app, the NHS.UK website, which has huge international use. Uh, Some are intended for use by clinicians or other functions within the NHS, such as uh, urgent and emergency care units, 111 call centres. Um, Some of our products are central platforms that underpin many national and local products. So central identity management and authentication systems, uh, national systems for electronic prescribing and electronic referrals, the NHS mail system. We also act as the national data custodian for patient records and other data which describes the NHS system. The NHS data set itself is internationally unique and as such it's an absolutely critical resource for clinical research, uh, as well as, of course, for the the direct care of patients and for system planning and management. Unlike most other countries, we have, within a single system, the records of more than 53 million individuals that describe their health from birth to death, every primary and secondary care intervention, every diagnosis, every allergy, every diagnostic and test result, every medicine they've been prescribed, their vaccination history, and much, much more. And of course, uh, details of how they would like that data to be used. 2020 was a completely extraordinary year for us, as you can imagine. We had to deliver new products at a breathtaking pace from the 111 triage systems, which handled the start of many COVID-19 patient journeys, uh, through to the digital infrastructure, which was needed to support the radical extension of test facilities in the UK, uh, to the systems needed to identify the clinically vulnerable so that they could be shielded and supported, to the vaccination service systems, and many, many more. Uh, We also had to scale existing services at a fairly extraordinary rate. In the early weeks of the pandemic, the peak load on one of our key systems was 95 times its highest ever previous peak load. Uh, We talk about elastic infrastructure. Well, I can tell you that kind of sudden, unplanned escalation in demand is a great way to assess the true elasticity of a platform. And on top of all this build and change activity, there was more than ever before absolutely zero tolerance for accessibility or performance issues on any of our key systems. It was critical that we maintain Five Nines reliability in an environment in which we were introducing change at a faster pace than we've ever done before. And that change, of course, often had to be deployed by teams who were working for our days uh, and juggling you know, significant personal and domestic challenges on top of their extreme workloads. So stable deployment environments, robust control systems, very sophisticated monitoring environments, uh, tested service patterns, high levels of automation, these were more than ever absolutely critical to our ability to support and protect the NHS. And of course, given we were dealing with the personal confidential health data of citizens, uh, the data whose confidentiality is more critical to people than any other data set, uh, security is always absolutely paramount. AWS has made much of this possible for us over the last year. Uh, We've been building out our AWS as a state for many years, and many times uh, we've reflected on the value of the AWS environment in which we operate those services today and the extraordinary power it gives us, particularly in terms of extreme scaling and deploying at pace. Uh, But for us, the pandemic hasn't just been an act of survival. It's really been a springboard. There's so much more energy and ambition for digital transformation within the NHS now than there was a year ago. And because digital services have been consumed at such pace and with such positive impact, there's a level of confidence about the journey ahead that's incredibly exciting. In terms of our AWS relationship, I have absolutely no doubt that what we've achieved in this environment to date is a tiny fraction of what we will achieve in the coming years. There is a huge raft of activity in front of us, uh, which won't just enable us to strengthen our existing platforms, but will allow us to embark on whole new journeys. Uh, In terms of the platform itself, we're thinking about how we can get the best out of the edge, leveraging centralized control of decentralized execution across a suite of devices, which might include anything from IoT traces on hospital beds to radiology equipment. Uh, At the data layer, we are really looking forward to working with AWS on evolving the design of Amazon Health Lake uh, and leveraging some of the fantastic products within that suite. 
Health data is messy stuff. Uh, it's often unstructured, inconsistent, incomplete. Uh, lots of really critical data is buried in clinical notes, not in structured data fields. Uh, and information about a single clinical matter may be dispersed across laboratory results, medical images, recorded conversations. Uh, it may be in very, very disparate formats. So organizing, indexing, and structuring this information is a necessary precursor to making the data useful and safe in direct patient care, in planning, and in medical research. Amazon's natural language processing capabilities are particularly exciting, I think, in this arena. So here's to powering the digital future of healthcare together. Thank you, Sarah. I'm so inspired when I hear how organizations like NHS Digital are rapidly innovating, even in complex sectors like healthcare. Stories like Sarah's are why we work hard to bring innovative solutions to you fast. For example, did you know the cloud is coming closer to you? It's true. And that's because of 5G. 5G can transform missions across public sector. And we've been working to make sure that you have the tools to take advantage of 5G. This includes services like AWS Wavelength and multiple form factors of AWS Outposts. In fact, we're already working with public sector customers to deploy these services and deliver results. I want to take a quick look at three of them. The Open Edge Computing Initiative at Carnegie Mellon University used AWS and a private 5G network to create a prototype tool that conducts real-time video analysis to help with physical distancing and mass compliance. In national defense, the U.S. Marine Corps Logistics Command is deploying a private 5G network at a warehouse in Georgia. The new network is going to use AWS to create a smart warehouse that uses robotics and augmented reality to improve inventory control. And one of my favorite examples comes from a small neighborhood in Sacramento, California. AWS is working with a nonprofit to build a 5G network owned by the community. Currently, students have to sit on the sidewalk to access a mobile Wi-Fi hotspot. The new 5G network will allow students to connect to Wi-Fi from their homes and participate in online learning even more effectively. Now, these examples are just scratching the surface. I'm really excited to see how our public sector customers innovate with 5G and AWS. Of course, no conversation about edge computing is complete without discussing space. One of our earliest public sector stories was NASA JPL. We started working with them in 2011 and AWS is still helping them explore Mars right at this very moment. Among other uses, NASA JPL is using AWS to process data from the Perseverance rover. They're doing it in record time. And this speed means that mission owners can make faster decisions and that lets them explore more of the red planet. AWS is also supporting the United Arab Emirates mission to Mars. With AWS Ground Station, the UAE is downlinking data from the HOPE orbiter to AWS and then automatically indexing and processing the data in less than 20 minutes. Finally, you may have seen the launch of Transporter 1. That's a mission to send a record 143 satellites into space. Well, there's something you may not have known that of those 143 satellites launched, 115 are satellites operated by AWS customers. And thanks to the power of cloud computing, our customers were able to communicate with their satellites moments after separation. So by now, it's clear that cloud is helping our customers to move faster and to realize mission outcomes. So how do you realize some of those same results as well? The answer starts with smart procurement and cloud policies. A few years ago, Teresa would show a list of all of the available procurement vehicles, and it was unfortunately a short list. But guess what? Customers and partners have made a lot of progress. In recent years, we've seen many new procurement vehicles both directly with AWS and importantly through our partners. There are now more than 150 direct and indirect government contract vehicles available to public sector customers. And the AWS marketplace offers even more options. 
with more than 8,000 cloud-based listings. I encourage you to talk with your AWS account managers and our partners to learn how to approach procurement so that you have the speed and agility to then plan and govern the use of your cloud in the way that drives these awesome mission outcomes. Our next speaker is going to share how his organization procured AWS to rapidly migrate to the cloud. And since starting with a plan to migrate five applications to AWS, he and his team have continued to experiment and evolve. Now they stand up multiple releases per year on AWS. And here to explain how they're doing more, please welcome Ah, Daryl Roberts, Program Executive with the U.S. Defense Logistics Agency. The Defense Logistics Agency is the United States Combat Logistics Support Agency. We're responsible for managing the global supply chain, providing more than $42 billion in goods and services annually for the Department of Defense, other federal agencies, and partner and allied nations, with more than 26,000 DLA civilian and military personnel stationed throughout the world. We support disaster response and humanitarian relief efforts globally, including hurricanes, and most recently the pandemic, making sure necessary items such as uniforms, food, and medical supplies get to where they need to, no matter the circumstances. And as the program executive office at DLA, we're responsible for managing approximately 200 IT applications, which support these DOD and DLA business operations, processing over 7 billion transactions per year with a business value of $465 billion. Our vision is to be an adaptive, innovative organization that always delivers the right things at the right place and at the right time, making speed, agility, and efficiency critical components for how we operate. Our on-premise systems have been experiencing outages and delays in deployments, and our team didn't have direct access, which created challenges and hindered our ability to resolve issues quickly. So we embarked on a digital business transformation journey beginning with our decision to modernize with the cloud for a more agile development framework that provides the flexibility needed to drive rapid performance and scale. We started our cloud journey with very aggressive timelines, initially migrating five applications to the cloud under the Procurement Integrated Enterprise Environment, or PIE, using our hosting support contract. We completed this migration in just 138 days, almost six weeks ahead of schedule. After some initial learnings, we even launched one app during business hours, which is unheard of. But we had gained confidence that we could do it without experiencing any downtime like we were used to. There were a few key factors that helped expedite this migration I'd like to share. One is that we had a unified vision. We got all necessary parties together across procurement and cybersecurity when making a decision to move to the cloud, allowing us to align on the how and why from the very beginning. Another is that we established accreditation for the entire environment instead of each individual application, helping to increase our cybersecurity efficiencies. And most importantly, our team stayed focused on the high goals we had set out to achieve. When working in government, some might expect to hear no or face roadblocks, but we kept driving with unreasonable ambition, which focused on outcomes. And this alignment, vision, and focus shows in the results we've been able to achieve. Specifically, we've increased and maintained a steady uptime above 98% compared to 95% with our previous systems. A recent example of our efforts includes supporting orders of personal protective equipment in response to the pandemic on our FedMall e-commerce platform, in which the reliability, agility, and speed with the cloud have been essential. We're now able to make direct code changes and accelerate the intake of items within the applications, saving us time, and presenting new educational opportunities for our team to get trained quickly on the cloud, reinforcing our culture to learn fast. We can stand our test environments up and down as needed, which frees up our database and administrator time and helps to make the most of our available resources. And we've continued to establish new standards and norms. Major releases viewed as agile in the government used to be four per year on major applications. Now in PIE, we stand up between six and eight per year on average, and 12 at a high point. Adoption of the cloud has been critical in helping to improve efficiencies and security and provide cost savings that we've been able to reinvest back into the program. 
We currently have about 85% of our applications on the cloud and plan to complete the full migration in the next few years. We're pulling from other cloud resources on lessons learned to migrate data quickly to SAP to the cloud, which will be a major milestone for DLA. And one of our apps supporting COVID-19 vaccine distribution will transition to the cloud within our SAP framework later this year. And there's still so much more to come as we keep getting comfortable in the environment. We'll further expand our capabilities and implement new tools based on our learnings. We also look forward to continuing our work with commercial cloud providers as a government customer to enhance the efficiencies that can be achieved by promoting multi-cloud tenancy and provide a framework that best meets our business and analytics capabilities. Modernizing our systems and moving to the cloud is enhancing the way we operate. As technology keeps evolving, we continue our cloud journey. Our valuable partnerships and unified team vision to have exceedingly high ambitions will help us stay at the forefront and deliver on our mission. Thank you. Thank you, Adaryl. Your story is a powerful example of how early momentum can deliver improved mission impact and success. So I spoke about the need to be thoughtful about procurement. Mission owners also need to be creative about attracting talent. And this includes diversity and equity as a priority. COVID-19 has added some urgency to this issue. According to the World Bank, less than half of all women participated in the global labor force in 2020. And that's a decrease from 51% in 1990. The US Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that 55% of all jobs lost between February and December of 2020 belong to women. And these stats are troubling, but they also present an opportunity because quite simply, there are too many talented individuals from all walks of lives who should have careers in cloud and technology. And we spend a lot of time thinking about talent development at AWS because there is a real cost to inaction. Let's look at the challenge of collecting and understanding your organization's data. Public sector organizations are sitting on vast stores of data and the amount of data continues to grow. Up until now, many organizations hired hundreds of employees to try and keep up. And ultimately this solution can't scale. Instead, mission owners need individuals with artificial intelligence and machine learning skills who can use these technologies to help their organizations gain real-time insights. So how do you compete for talent in a competitive field like AI and ML? An important first step is to embrace new educational models that emphasize skills and encourage underrepresented communities to participate. AWS has supported many of these models from supporting the development of cloud degrees at colleges and universities to supporting public private partnerships that provide reskilling opportunities. In Spain, for example, AWS is working with the national government to train unemployed workers. At the end of the program, the graduates earn the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner Certification. This is a foundational certification. It's a future for a cloud career. Of course, AWS isn't the only organization finding ways to build cloud talent. And our next speaker not only developed a new cloud computing diploma in the UK, but he and his team continue to create new opportunities that are designed to fit the changing needs of students. And to help me explain more, please welcome Rod Bristow, president of Pearson. Pearson is the world's learning company. We work in 70 countries and touch the lives of 100 million learners with curriculum, qualifications, and online services. We're passionate about helping people make progress in their lives through learning. And just like our lives and work itself, education's changing and the rate of change is accelerating. 25 years of steady growth in online learning has sped up during the pandemic. I should say high quality online learning isn't to be confused with the sort of remote learning many of our children experienced this last year and quality really matters. As part of our own digital transformation efforts, we began our cloud journey with AWS back in 2013 to provide educators and learners with high quality online digital services. By leveraging the cloud, 
we've been able to scale high traffic periods around midterms and final exams, create next generation apps, and develop new products like iretext, a digital textbook alternative, and Revel, an interactive digital learning environment. And we've also seen shifts in how students want to consume content. They often prefer to learn online, with many now seeking shorter, stackable learning experiences in a do-it-yourself format to better serve their lifestyles whether they're pursuing a higher degree or learning additional skills. Pearson has adapted to meet these shifts. We now employ 1,100 developers globally who build and support our online learning programs. And while the cloud has helped power our internal transformation, we understand the importance of teaching cloud-based skills to help shape the future workforce. Which brings me to another key trend, and that is the growing need to sharpen the link between education and employment, since work takes up such a large space in our lives. Work's changing, and along with it, the need for digital skills, especially in cloud computing. They're outpacing the development of those skills. Cloud computing skills are now vital and are going to be in demand long into the future, creating a need for a cloud computing qualification. So just last year, we collaborated with AWS Educate to develop the first ever Business and Technology Education Council, that's BTEC, Higher National Diploma in Cloud Computing. BTEC Higher Nationals are work-related, globally recognized, higher education qualifications delivered at colleges, workplaces and universities in 50 countries. The qualifications are equivalent to the first two years of a UK honours degree and can lead either to a higher degree or directly to a job. We created the BTEC in cloud computing with cloud industry experts across businesses to make sure that they meet industry standards. And Pearson BTEC Higher Nationals in Cloud Computing will be delivered across our global network of over 600 universities and colleges where educators, employers and students can access online learning resources provided by AWS Educate remotely or in person. And as more people achieve their BTEC, companies will have access to a wider pool of skilled cloud computing talent to support the changing workforce. And this is only the beginning. We'll be creating more short and stackable courses with AWS that lead to a full degree with a range of university partners and we'll take the curriculum down to high school level too. We're also continuing to innovate with the cloud and build new solutions to meet the needs of learners and educators globally, including pioneering virtual elementary and high schools such as Pearson Online Academy, which we launched earlier this year. It's a new virtual school for families anywhere in the world wanting their children to study US curriculum or British International A-Level and GCSEs, and indeed BTEX, in a range of subjects. And with our recently announced partnership with Hawaii Pacific University, where new online nursing degrees are going to be made available on Pearson Pathways. Pearson Pathways is our online higher and career education marketplace where we deliver personalized recommendations and the ability to apply to these programs from all over the world in one online learning destination. Education truly is a stepping stone and we're excited to empower learners at all key moments and to provide affordable high quality online learning that opens up new opportunities. We'll continue to invest in cloud computing skills and cloud computing will also hold a key to ever more effective online learning, helping to power and transform the workforce of today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Reimagining educational models is part of the equation. The other question is how to teach your workforce to reimagine the art of the possible. 
As you know, Teresa has been a longtime advocate for building a workforce that is ready to meet the needs of the 21st century. And so I'd like to bring Teresa back for a conversation with two special guests. And I hope this conversation provides some insights into how public sector organizations can build your team of world-class cloud talent. Thank you, Max. So I'm thrilled to be here today with two amazing and special guests. So joining me in the studio today is Maureen Lonergan. Maureen leads our AWS training and certification program at Amazon Web Services. She is a passionate advocate for expanding education and opportunity to everyone, regardless of their circumstances. And before Maureen started at AWS almost eight years ago, she spent time teaching um, school children in Mozambique, Africa. We are so lucky to have Maureen at AWS building a training strategy to help people and organizations change the world with cloud computing and technology. Um, and I can say that for sure, Maureen has literally built our training and certification program from scratch. So thank you, Maureen. And I appreciate you being thank here you. today. But I'm also excited to have a very special guest here with us. Uh, Dr. Tarika Barrett is joining us from New York City. Like always, we're, we can be virtual or in person. Um, Tarika is the CEO of an amazing organization called Girls Who Code. Uh, it's a global organization dedicated to increasing the number of women in computing, computer science, by equipping these young women with the skills that they need to pursue 21st century job opportunities. Um, Tarika joined Girls Who Code in 2016 and has played a critical role in its success. She's overseen programs that have reached 300,000 girls around the world, more than half whom are Black, Latinx, or come from low-income backgrounds. Tarika, I'm so honored that you're able to join us here today. So thank you so much for coming live from New York City. Let's kick it off. And Tarika, can I start with you? Let me start with you. And I want to talk about the importance of engaging uh, young girls and other students early. Before you joined Girls Who Code, you spent your career in education, including your time in New York City's Department of Education. Can you kind of tell us some of the lessons that you learned from your time in education? Thank you so much for that question, Teresa. You know, my time at the DOE was such an important part of my journey that informs how I think about the equity work that I'm doing now. As you mentioned, I got my start as a teacher and eventually I had the chance to work at the New York City Department of Education Central, where I got to design and launch schools um, where issues of equity, both in terms of gender and race would be central. And it was during that time that I saw firsthand that our education system is simply not set up to close a gender gap in tech. And that problem has grown far worse in this moment of COVID. And you know, right now, so many of us are sitting, frankly, looking at all of this with dismay, this enormous digital divide that our students are experiencing, many of whom who don't have access to the internet or a computer. That number is actually 12 million students right now that don't have access to the internet. And more than a third of our Black and Latinx students don't have access to either a computer or high-speed Wi-Fi. And we know that the issues go far beyond just connectivity. You know, we know that some of our students don't have the same level of digital fluency as other students, making it so difficult for them to keep up with the demands of remote learning. During this moment, as I reflect especially on what I understood was happening at the DOE, I am especially concerned for all of our girls and the ones who are girls of color in particular, because I know that many of them have dropped out of school entirely. They have caregiving responsibilities or other responsibilities, and they're gonna fall far behind in their studies because of remote learning. And sadly, these are inequities that we know persist into the workforce, where women, and especially our women of color, have been disproportionately impacted by COVID and the economic downturn that we're all experiencing in this country. And so, you know, as I step into this role of CEO at Girls Who Code, I am so deeply committed and focused to figuring out how we're gonna support these girls in school. We're gonna expand this amazing career pipeline that we've developed over these years. And we're also gonna support our young women as they enter the tech industry so that they actually persist and move up in their careers. It, it's so true, you know, uh, 
women in general were were disproportionately affected by COVID. And then you take women of color and they're on top of that and all the responsibilities. And then so many now are without jobs. So I do I do see it as a huge issue. And we talked a lot in, inside of AWS. We we're we're going backwards. We got to figure out how to stop the bleeding okay. here. And I but I should say congratulations. You did just take on the CEO <laughs> role, of course. And just in your role as CEO, we, we discuss in these areas, but of all the barriers, which ones do you think that are the most urgent that we should kind of start with and really address immediately? Yeah, Teresa, that question is such um, an important one and a tough one because there's some complexity there. And first, let me just say thank you for your kind words of congratulations about stepping into the CEO seat. You know, this organization has given me so much and is such a part of who I am. And after five years of working at Girls Who Code, I have seen firsthand that passionate, ambitious, and diverse young women are absolutely the key to transforming our modern workforce and the world. But having said that, and to address your question directly, I've also experienced and seen that, you know, sparking this love and interest in STEM and computer science in our girls is just not enough to solve this pipeline problem that they continue to encounter. It is so much deeper than just teaching STEM and STEM education. Too many of the girls who we've taught to just fall in love with coding and tech end up leaving the industry because they continue to encounter these systemic barriers when they've quote unquote made it. And systemic barriers are the reasons that so, so many of our girls are actually dropping out of computer science. And that's what I'm dedicated to tackling. So my work ahead looks like tripling the number of our free after school clubs that we launch over the next few years, you know, designing and launching workforce development programs and mentorship programs so that our alums and other young women know that Girls Who Code will be there to support them, you know, yeah. from the journey from school into the workforce. So that's a huge part of what, you know, I'm going to focus on. But I think the thing, Teresa, that is sort of the other part of this problem are our young women actually being supported once they get that first job in the tech industry? We know that the cultures that exist are very much designed and set up for white men to succeed. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, it's good. And I think, you know, we'll probably talk about this. Companies are finally waking up and, you know, being reflective and looking at internal diversity and inclusion practices. But we know it's not enough just to say that. It has to translate into actual change. And so as CEO, I'm excited to work with companies, you know, in the field who actually want to meaningfully accelerate change in the areas of systems and culture that we know we have to dismantle. Yeah, it's so true. And we, I think if COVID has taught us anything, we can break a bunch of norms. We can change the way we work. We can change the old habits and we can turn them into new opportunities. And I think for especially women, this is a time that we can do this. You remember? They said no telehealth. Insurance won't pay for telehealth. This is an example. Mm -hmm. A norm was totally broken, and we see that working in a big way. Why can't we change these kind of things now and make it happen? So, so agree with you. Maureen, you have been an amazing advocate uh, for training and certification and for just women in tech. And, And the things that you've been doing, the skills, you've developed so many. I think you have over 500 online courses, and you are really trying to make that um, accessible to everyone. Can you talk about kind of in the AWS training and certification program, you see a lot of these individuals come in almost for the first time and they're learning the cloud skills and they're developing that new muscle of doing that. Can you give us a sense of what that's like? What's the experience and what you see kind of as the outcome from these, from these new muscles they get to build? Yeah. I think um, this year has been interesting because we've had to pivot everything to virtual, but it's been a blessing in a lot of ways. So we've really invested in building out our technology platform and digital classes and virtual-led instructor training. Um, But the design point, I mean, we believe we need to build the diverse workforce for the future. And so everything that we build, we want to make consumable by anybody that wants access to it. So, you know, we provide a ton of free training to um, to any Anybody who wants it through our platform. Um, but we also have very specific programs um, geared towards women in tech and um, 
diverse communities or underserved communities. So we've got a great program called Restart. Yeah. We've been Love able to that program. <laughs> we've been able to roll that out across the globe and and reach so many more people. It's a twelve week twelve week online program. Um, that takes people from industries like, um, you know, the travel industry, which has been heavily impacted, you know, with especially with women, um, and gives them 12 weeks of hands-on training. And then we have partnerships where we partner them with companies that are hiring um, kind of young in their career talent. So it's, yeah. it's been an exciting year. Well, you, you did an amazing thing taking everything online, but you actually saw a lot of uptick as yes. well, right? And yep. a lot of, in both, can you talk about that a little bit in terms of the uptick that you saw online? Yeah, so we had to pivot all of our training courses to online and our certification programs. And, you know, it slowed down for about a month, but what we really saw was, especially working with companies and organizations, is they were hungry. You know, yeah. there was some time there to develop. And, and so we actually... Uh, trained, you know, hundreds of thousands of more people last year than we thought we would due to the the digital capabilities. You know, across, uh, you know, all types of, yeah. of individuals. You know, people that were in the workforce, people transitioning their skills, people who had no tech experience, business individuals who wanted to learn tech. You know, so it's it's been exciting. Yeah. You and I were just in a room earlier where our individual running our uh, some of our government training, yeah. and we saw individuals in government just picking up because they like couldn't get in and they were yeah. spending some extra time training. Yeah. Maureen, kind of one other quick question. There's a study by IDC, Futurescape, that predicts by 2020 an estimated 30% of global IT jobs, 30% will be left open while employers compete for talent. And we yeah. hear that a lot. What are you kind of hearing from the customers are the most common IT roles that they need to fill in their organizations today? You know, it's it's actually all roles. It's not just limited to tech. That's the interesting thing with cloud. Like when we go into organizations, we're looking at building cloud fluency against all all their all the people in the organization. We have great programs that are online and free, and 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 uh, companies are looking for this talent. But we do solution architecture, developer, um, uh, security, networking, yeah. databases, and so all of those. And, and, and we've really invested very heavily in AI and ML. We have five learning paths for that, again, all available online. So yeah. that's what we're seeing. And I talk a lot to our customers, not only about developing their internal talent, because there is such a huge gap, we need to transition from traditional infrastructure, but also working with them to identify where they can bring in entry level talent. How do we yeah. partner with them? You know, what programs do we have? How are we supporting our customers? And you know, a, a lot of the customers that we work with want this entry level talent. They have oh, you know totally. diversity goals as well, and women in tech. And so it's it's been an exciting year. It has. And Tarika, you talked a, a minute about. Um, not just the coding skills, but the, the soft skills, the things that women need to learn, girls need to learn. Do you mind to just discuss that a little bit more? Like, what are you seeing happening out there where they're able to learn a combination of not just the coding, like you said, because they've got to learn to deal with all aspects of the work environment. Can you talk a little bit more about how you pull that together and things that you're hearing the needs out there? Yeah, Teresa, if your question is about some of the soft skills and what we do with our girls and young women, central to our efforts in our curriculum is very much bravery, resilience, the sisterhood. I know we're laughing and chuckling because these are very familiar to us, but we forget yes. that so much of what our young women are up against is that sense of that they actually belong, right? That yeah. they have every right to have a seat at the table. So at Girls Who Code, it's not just teaching girls computer science. It's teaching them to lead and thrive in the tech industry, mm -hmm. having them be very aware of some of the barriers they're going to encounter and the fact that they can lean on this sisterhood and what they've learned and the tech skills, frankly, that they've gathered to be successful. Um, and, you know, of course, on the company side, we know that there is work to be done to make sure that they feel welcome. And yeah. Maureen, I'm so heartened to hear of your efforts and the work that you've been doing. So much of it mirrors our own steps to move everything online. But the uptake that Teresa just asked you about, that's phenomenal. So congratulations on that work. Our women really need that programming right now. So that's amazing. And, and we know like the thing that we've really seen is this stackable credentialing, I think as well for, 
for women who can learn a skill and then add to that skill. But I, but what you said, I it is just so important that that the women understand they can lean on each other, learn from each other, and grow. And we do have to amplify, I think. And we have to teach them that it's important that they, you know, building those muscles are, are not always easy, but you learn from building that. So, um, Maureen, I wanted to ask you a question about a group that's kind of near and dear to my heart, which is public sector. Yep. Um, Knowing that there's a, that the skills gap is large and that public sector organizations have to compete with high, high paying, um, fast growing tech companies and others in private industry, how do you think that the AWS training and certification can help public sector organizations meet their goal? And also, it is an area, if you look in public sector, it is one of the areas that actually does have a lot of diversity in their hiring right. as well, yeah. which I like to really encourage because if you look across most of my customers, the Middle East is an example. Yeah. You know, I've talked about that. There's 65% of the women are the ones doing the coding and development yeah. of the hard skills that are in there. But what are you seeing there? So I think in general, we have to, um, just as an organization, we need to make sure that we're really training millions of people so that, that isn't, it isn't such a competitive environment, yeah. right? That's like the job one for me. I yeah. Think, you know, yeah, totally. Number one, right, is like get more talent out there in any way we, we can do that, whether it's through STEM programs mm -hmm. or, or customer programs or film, you know, philanthropic stuff. Um, but I think for, for public sector, you know, we, I work with a lot of the public sector customers mm -hmm. um, and we talk through, you know, how do they think about talent development? How do they think about recruitment? And it's it's partnering with them and really understanding what their goals are and embedding learning into their culture. Because yeah. what we've seen is if you invest in employees, mm -hmm. they they want to stay. They want to stay with the company and they want to um, thrive, right? Yeah. And so I think really branding yourself as an organization that is developer of talent and and, and bringing in young talent yeah. is where where they're going to see the most success. I think yeah. I you know. You, for me personally, I want to love the company I work for, and yeah. that's what keeps me here at AWS. And I think you know it's it's a big cultural transformation for any company. It totally is, and you know it's interesting because even in like a not for profit, yeah. they will say to me, "Look, we really need your help getting talent in the door." But they will also say, we are kind of feel like we're an engine for yeah. talent because we know that we're going to train, get people in, and they're probably going to leave. And I do think a lot of employers um, feel that they may get turnover, so they have to create mm -hmm. everybody. Like you said, you want to create a platform that everybody's learning, yeah. not just the few. And, um, you know, Tariq, I'd love your thoughts on this. I have seen over the years, I'm always worried when my talent does leave, though. Maureen talked about staying, and we want to get them to stay. And I always say if you don't have your data, you don't know, especially with women, people of color, any diversity, if you're not kind of understanding your data, then you don't know what's happening. Um, what, do you, what do you see in terms of when you talk to the women, why do they stay or leave in a single location? What kind of inputs are you getting from them? No, I, that question is uh, a really important one. And Maureen, I couldn't agree more with what you shared. And Teresa, the data is so important. Um, I would say right now, I've had a conversation recently with another CEO, and the most striking thing was when I pulled back and said, okay, this is your attrition data, but what does it look like across demographics? And especially in this moment of COVID, we have to pay attention. And much of what Maureen talked about, all of these things are intuitive and make sense around why folks will stay in a given organization. Maureen, you talked about loving where you work it's strong and invested managers, you know, the ability to grow within a given organization, competitive pay, along with mentorship and support. This is gonna be the thing that keeps anyone, regardless of gender. And at Girls Who Code, we now have over 80,000 college-aged alums who go on to major and work in computer science and related fields at 15 times the national average. As I said before, our focus as an organization is what happens to these young women when they are so excited and get that first tech job, you know, in the industry, and are they going to be supported? And so, you know, we did a study recently with Accenture and found that 50% of women actually left the tech industry by the age of 35. Mm -hmm. That compares to 20% for other jobs. And so 
let's be honest, we know that this is also about a culture reset in tech because companies are still not set up. All the things I started talking about that Maureen also highlighted, they are not designed with women in mind and especially women of color. And this is what we have to all focus on and something that I'm deeply committed to tackling you know, as CEO because it means we have to dismantle existing systems. And Teresa, you talked about this and developing more inclusive ones where we know we can help women actually persist. Yeah. You know, COVID has been uh, such a, you know, no one wishes for a pandemic, but I think we all as leaders have learned so much. And I like to say you have to operate with grace during this time. But the fun part for me also has been days where I've seen moms or dads with their children or yeah. their, or their, you know, or their parents where, you know, they enter the room, they're crying or like, you're like, just bring them in, put them on your lap. Like you have to be able to operate with some grace and make sure people understand that we're all human. And I think for women in this environment, it, it gets, it's, it's much more challenging because they, they do, to your point, feel like they're being looked at and judged more. But I would say we also need more female CEOs like you because we have to create that environment where women who lead also understand the environment that actually has to be created over time. Um, Maureen, um, you know, one of the things, we, you know, we hear this a lot both internally and from our partners is that long-term career growth that people look for in tech. It's not just the starting point, yeah. but the ending point. Uh, when you're talking both to the customers and partners about this and just individuals who get trained, wh what's your mindset on how we can create that long-term opportunity for technical talent? Like, how do we how do we take those individuals and help them see that they have a long-term, it's not just one and done, but it, that's a starting point, maybe not the ending mm -hmm. point. I think there's a couple of things. I'm, when we work with companies, we really talk to them about create this culture of learning right within the organization and that does a lot of things right so you want to make education techs moving so fast they don't yeah. have the luxury now it used to be you yep. sell a piece of technology train them once and it'd be great for a couple of years that is not and that's across all technologies right they're moving so rapidly so i think creating an environment where it's um easy for people to learn i think setting up communities yeah. um to help foster learning and have people evangelizing within the organization, put some recognition mm -hmm. programs in for that. And then we also really work uh, with a lot of companies on their talent development strategy. You know, what are the roles are they hiring today and what do they look like in the future and trying to embed training within those career pathings. We've done that with some really really cool companies and and you know we've seen retention with those companies yeah. where they had huge attrition problems and now they're starting to see you know that they can retain especially like ter um, more compliance oriented industries mm -hmm. like you know fin financial services yeah. where they weren't able to recruit top talent but now they're being you know out there in the media and they're saying we're investing and we're hiring and and so we've seen great success and that's actually led to a lot of companies trying to connect and find how they're developing talent and and retaining it well, and there are, to your point, so many skills, telcos, yes. again, 5G, you know, yes. all the new opportunities there, the digital call center, yeah. right? Individuals who worked inside a call center now, we have all that in cloud and yeah. they can work remotely. Yes. So if you if you equate that to women in the job, those are the kind of jobs that they can actually do also wherever they are. So, I mean, it's, it's so true. And I think I think it's also super important for companies to be super intentional about their culture and being inclusive, right? Yeah. It's very hard. I mean, you know, we're women, you you've been sitting at the table and it's hard to find your voice mm -hmm. and and having leadership from an organization that is providing space yeah. for people to ask the questions and 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 fail if and and not and be okay with that. Truly. So I mean, so true, Maureen. Um Tariq, I just want to spend a minute talking about engaging individuals who've dropped out of the workforce, which, again, you gave all the statistics, which are staggering at the beginning of this. In the last year, it's it's been truly alarming. The World Bank actually reports that the number of women in the global label, labor workforce is lower than it was in 1990. It's super scary for us, honestly. We, we, you know, we were, we were so excited about that we were going forward, and this feels so much like we've moved backwards. So now there's a large pool of talented women sitting on the sidelines. 
Um, how are you seeing this and how, what do you recommend to organizations right now that can tap into these amazing women that are out there that need to be brought back into the workforce? Yeah, Teresa, the data that we have now, you know, luckily we, we kind of move forward. We're not disheartened, but it's hard. In 1995, 37% of computer engineers were women. That number is only 24% today. So when you ask what companies should do, you know, I think we need to interrogate the notion that we can simply quote unquote tap talent and bring them back yeah. into the workforce. And I think this is what we're talking about. It's what Maureen said, what you've said, the fallout that we're seeing from COVID, you know, is a result of so many women having to make an impossible choice between their careers and their kids. And so we know that it's the women who are overwhelmingly the caregivers, and that's not going to change until we provide resources to support them with that responsibility. So when companies are sitting and reflecting about what true diversity and inclusion can look like and creating an inclusive culture, which Teresa, you talked about, it's childcare, it's paid parental leave, it's flexible and asynchronous work hours. We certainly don't need to go back to the negative things pre-pandemic. We definitely have some learnings we can lean on now. And increasing the salaries of women so that they don't have to make the choice between their career and their kids. Let's yes. be honest, you know, women didn't drop out of the workforce. They fell because we had no supports to catch them. And so, so much of this is an opportunity. And Teresa, you started by saying this, there's not a lot about COVID that we wanna say is positive, but this is an area where we don't need to turn back and do things negatively. Yeah. How do we support our women in the workforce so that they can persist regardless of industry and field? Yeah, it's so true. And I do believe this is the opportunity that we can embrace to let women work virtually, have uh, reduced work hours if necessary, or flexible work hours, because we have got to tap into that talent. Maureen knows one of the other big things I'm excited about doing is helping to create a, what, a sales tech training program. Because I tell everybody, we need a lot more talent in sales tech, which is actually also super technical. So there's all types of roles and jobs out there that we've got to encourage women to get going on. Even if, even if all they can do is part-time, financially, it will be super rewarding. And we, we really appreciate all you've done with uh, in your organization globally, by the way. I think you have a big sorority around the world that can, uh, <laughs> we're going to be able to tap into, which is great. That's right. So, Thank you. Yeah, exactly. That, Maureen, I know, you know, I kind of, when I do things, I like to close in every con conversation with an action plan. So we got to give some actionable things to do. Um, how can organizations navigate AWS today training and certification to get going? Like, what, what would you say they do right now to get going? Go to aws.training. We have, <laughs> you know, the 500 free courses. We've got very detailed learning paths. It's really easy to consume and learn from a business um, business or tech perspective. And, and, um, and we're going to continue. You're going to see a lot coming out from us over the next six to nine months where we're using uh, new learning styles because everybody likes to learn differently. Yeah. And so we've had a lot, a lot of time the last couple months to really think about how do we incorporate some of our own technology um, and, and make the learning experience a lot yeah. more um, interesting. And, and uh, so... I can validate Maureen. I've read some of her docs. She has got some big and fun things yeah. on the way. And I'm hoping that we can work with you jointly, Tarika, to yeah. make this a reality for your organization. We're so excited about our partnership with you and want to continue to work as much as we can together to grow this amazing workforce of women. So I want to thank you both so much for joining us today for the Worldwide Public Sector Summit and bringing the insightful information you did and just your passion to the table. So thank you again, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in person soon, Tarika. Thank, thank you, Mark. Thank you thank so you. much. I hope that you've enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. I wanna close today's keynote the same way I started by saying thank you, thank you. I've so enjoyed every minute that I've spent with you understanding your goals and challenges, and building our digital muscle together over the years. We've had so much fun over the years through this journey. I'm so pleased that Max will be here to expand what we built on together. 
So I encourage you all to stay on the cloud journey and move fast. And that starts right now with exploring the rest of the Worldwide Public Sector Summit. Following the keynote, you can attend dozens of breakout sessions, visit our learning zones, and take advantage of these live workshops. And we have tons of other hands-on learning opportunities. And don't worry, if you can't fit everything in today, you can access the content online for the next three months. So log in again at any time. Thank you all again for an incredible Worldwide Public Sector Summit, and thank you for joining Max and I today.